Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Con Report wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A M P I R E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. Don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. I'll have a story up next day or two about a lot of the new leadership here, the impact of the early goings of that leadership, what it means. And I also talked to Bobby. A lot of it's going to center around Bobby Wagner. And I did talk to Wagner for about 10, 15 minutes by myself. And at some point, I'll play that on the podcast. And it's just an audio. So the YouTubers, you know, just so, just so you know, but it was a good interview with him talking about leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So stay tuned. That'll I'll play that at some point in June. Not sure when, maybe next week. Um, also next week, I'll be joined by ESPN's Lewis Riddick. So stay tuned for that as well. Um, and on Friday, I'll be joined by the voice of the commanders, Bram Weinstein. Lot, lot going on, lot to discuss. So I wanted to bring all these folks on. And also, I just wanted to give a quick little shout out. This has nothing to do with anything in particular. And it's not even a paid ad, but a shout out to Catchmark Construction in Chantilly, Virginia. Because every time it, we've gotten some storms here, and every time I see that, I think, thank goodness that they put on our new roof. So, and this is not a paid ad. It's just a guy that I've known for a long time who does really good work. That's Catchmark Construction in Chantilly, Virginia. Anyways, shout out to Steve Catchmark. So anyway, on to football, because that's why you're here. Now here to talk about a roof. And we were going to wrap up another day of an OTA session that... Um, was very very hot. We we were pushing almost ninety degrees here. I think it was in the it was definitely in the upper eighties, and quite hot. So you're getting used to football weather already, and it kind of led you to thinking about what's it going to be like in Miami when they have to go down there for a joint practice in August. So we'll be a lot like this, but worse. Anyway, that's fine. Um, there's all. It's also one thing you like that I enjoy with these um, seven. On, excuse me, with the OTA stuff, you do see some competition in there, right? And that's obviously Dan Quinn talked a lot, talks a lot about how much he loves to compete. And I would say that during when you get into seven on seven, the competitive side of every athlete takes over, and no matter who's coaching, it's going to get like that. So it's not just because they have the change of coaches. I think there's a lot of other things that come with that. But when you when you get to one on one situations or you play, you know, you have an offense versus a defense, those guys like to compete quite a bit. Anyways, we saw it today. I'll get to some of that stuff in a minute involving Terry McLaurin. And then and Terry was a bit pumped up about some things today, Jahan Dotson in particular. So stay tuned for those for some of those observations. Anyways, I'm gonna start with Jaden Daniels today because why not? You know, this this is this guy's sort of important here. So one of the things you, you know, again, we talked to vets about him and they've now been around him for a week and a half or so. And so some of the things you hear about him is they'll talk about his poise. You know, Bobby Wagner's talked about that, his composure. Um, you know, John Allen was talking, they, they talk, I've had the podcast yesterday talking about the work he's put in and John Allen brought that up. They've all brought that up. And it's funny because they do get smiles on their faces when they start to talk about him. So there's a noticeable liking of, of Jaden Daniels already. And one of the things John Allen was talking about how he gets here really early and, and Jaden is almost, is always here before him. And I asked him after the, after he got done talking to us, I asked John just like, well, what time, what time do you get here? He goes six forty five. the bastards here already. And he's joking, of course, um, about, you know, the term, but, but not joking about the fact that Daniels is already there. So that's how you win in the NFL. That's how you become a really good quarterback. And one of the, one of the guys too was talking about, I think it was Wagner was talking about how like, don't be afraid to be great. And just as, a, as some advice to him, and which is good because you don't want to be, you don't, you need to embrace that. I do think what, what um, Daniel's done pretty well is not put himself above anything. And I think that's very smart, but the poise, the composure, the work, that's why, that's what you're doing. That's how you impress vets. Then you go on the field and you take what you learn and you take what you can do out there and then you impress them even more. And that's how you win guys over. Anyway, he had one play in in the seven on seven looks um, in seven on seven plays where he's looking to the left, goes back to the right, and he hits Jahan Dotson over Mike Davis, just a dime and a really good catch. Nice job by 
by Dotson winning at the line of scrimmage. I'm going to point. I'm going to get to that again in a minute. And again, that involves Terry McLaurin. So, but the one thing you see with 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 Daniels, he does get the ball out fast, and um, you see less. Has, certainly at this stage of where he's at in his development in the NFL, compared to where some other young players would be at at this point, gets the ball out quicker by and large. And you know, um, certainly than other a lot of other young quarterbacks that I have seen. Has the arm talent. And the arm talent, when when people talk about arm talent, it's not necessarily just arm, it's not arm strength. Um he has good arm strength, not tremendous, good arm strength, but he has arm talent. And the talent comes from the compact delivery and um see it go. Like the coaches when Kirk Cousins were here would talk about that with him, that he had arm talent. And that's what they would mean is. When he's going through his progressions, once you see it, you're going, and that's what that's what um, Daniels does pretty well. We've seen that out here already, and a couple times uh, he had to scramble, but you know, as soon as he sees a guy, he's getting it to him. And even in the scrambles, like he's not waiting for the guy to get wide open. If there's an opening, he's going to get try and get that in there, which is what happened, which is what you do in the NFL. Um, there, it's not always going to work. Because there was one time in in the corner of the end zone, I think he was throwing to, oh, I can't remember who it was. It may have been, may have been Dax Milne, the corner of the end, in the front corner of the end zone, but Caillou Blue Kelly read it right, was not open, and stepped right in front of him. Would have been a pick, but he stepped out of bounds when, when he got the ball, but a nice play by Kelly nonetheless. Another time, throws back to the middle of the end zone, Percy Butler's there, tips it up. And then Anthony Pittman grabs it. He was throwing to Zach Ertz. So, you know, not everything's going to work out, but um, I do like that he's always ready to throw. And I think you see that consistently from him. And, you know, the funny thing is um, we we haven't seen a big part of his game, which is the legs. We have seen some scrambles. Back in 2015, when Robert was still holding on to the job, and it's not just him, but I'll get – you know, you see it last year too with Howell sometimes where you're holding the ball a little bit and those seven on sevens, you would take off running. Now it's going to happen in a game, but in the seven on seven, you want to see them get rid of the ball. So even in this situation, I think what's good for them is to go through some of these scramble drills. And so you see, even with, with, um, you saw it with Mariota, you'd see it with Daniels where they might take off and scramble a little bit and they're going to try and throw the ball because we know they can run when it's on air. So you want to try and throw the ball, see what you can do. And I think that's what that kid is doing. What I like is, you know, for a kid, for, for, for a young kid, he's 20, he's going to be 24 for a young, for a young man, for a new guy in this league. I think he does a good job of not trusting what he sees and not waiting till a guy is wide open. I mentioned that earlier, but I do think that's important. He's not being cautious. In other words, that's the word. That's the word I was looking for. He's not being cautious. I think he's being smart. I think he's being, you know, aggressive, but not in a, in a wild fashion for sure. Um, not that, you know, patience, another time, good patience on a deep cross to the earth's hit throw, hits him on the left deep out, basically crossing right to left. And Ertz has to go up a little bit for the ball, makes a nice catch. But that's it's good patience by him waiting for the route to develop. I know there's no pass rush, so it's seven on seven. So you should be patient, but you still have to be patient just going through your progressions, your reads. And again, I point it out all the time. What I like is when he does go through his reads, how the feet match up with the eyes. And that's why the ball, the ball is on target most of the time. And I've mentioned this before, but these guys, one of the things these guys that jumps out to the staff, I think, is how few balls actually hit the ground. And I can tell you that doesn't always happen. I remember a practice, I think it was not last season, but in 2022, near the end of the year, where you're watching just plays like this, just on air, and a lot of balls hitting the ground. It's like, oh my God, this is horrible. And and it was, and you're not seeing that now. So I think that's a good sign. And today in those seven and sevens, it was pretty much Mariota and 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 um, Jaden Daniels. So anyways, there you go. Trades, free agents, quarterbacks, and all kinds of adventures await the Commanders this offseason. Looking for an adventure of your own? The Adventure Park at Sandy Spring has you covered. The country's largest ropes course and zipline park, located in Montgomery County, Maryland, is now open. Named Best Amusement Park and Climbing Destination in the DMV 
two years in a row, the Adventure Park at Sandy Spring is perfect for birthdays, corporate outings, groups, and families. With challenges anywhere from beginner to expert, there is something for all skill levels. Anytime you're thinking about reaching new heights, make sure you know before you go. The Adventure Park at Sandy Spring is the only ACCT accredited park in Maryland or Virginia. Staying on the ground? Give axe throwing a try. You can throw at traditional targets or play any number of interactive games. You can even upload your own image. So there you have it, folks. Climbing, zip lining, axes, food, and bonfires right in your backyard. Reserve your adventure today at www.theadventurepark.com backslash kind. That's www.theadventurepark.com backslash kind. Dan Quinn said he was asked during his pressure, he talks before the before practice starts. So when he was talked, he was asked about um, Emmanuel Forbes being working at returner. And one of the things he did talk about, obviously, is that this, this is the time of the year where you see what guys can do. And again, it's not a novel approach, but it's absolutely the right one. And I think they need to see what guys can do. You need to put them in situations with can this, can player X do this? It doesn't mean when you see them out here in the spring, it doesn't mean this is necessarily the plan for them all year. It's just like, can this person do that? Um, so you experiment a little bit. I mean, Forbes was returning kickoffs because he's a very skilled runner in the open field. You saw this in college. It's why it's why he led the NCAA. He set a record for number of um, pick sixes in college. So that's what you do. And he has a skill find a way to use it. That's one of the things I, I really, really appreciate here is that they, they seem intent on what can a guy do? How can they then get him to do it? And that's just good coaching. And again, it's not necessarily novel because a lot of guys say that, but I don't know that everybody always does it because sometimes when push comes to shoves, you're, you're afraid to use it or some coaches look too much at what guys can't do rather than what can he do? Because he's on the roster for a reason. So find a way to tap into what he does. So that's what Greg Williams always thought as a defensive coach was terrific at doing that. Anyway, the other guy that they're doing this with is Jamin Davis. So during, you know, he's clearly still working at linebacker, but he's also working in with some defensive end stuff as a, this looks more like in a pass rush situation, right? Certainly not full time because he's again working with the linebackers, but he is working with the edge rushers when um, in in some early practice drills, just coming off the ball, ba some balance drills as a rusher to maintain, you know, to to turn the corner and keep your hips, or to, you know, you know, whatever. And so he he was doing that again today. So saw that, watch him a little bit, and there was one time where comes off the ball, takes an inside path. And this is just in, in warm-ups, right? You're just going against the guy on the other side is another defensive player who's holding the bag as a blocker, right? So it's not like you're going, there's no contact a lot in these, in these practices, but you're working on technique, you're working on footwork, et cetera. So the tap, Daryl Tap, the D-line coach, loved how he made this one and just came off the ball, just cuts inside and just a good footwork, good job by, by Davis. Um, then watched him run and they have one drill where you're coming off the ball, but they have like a big hoop on the ground and you just got to go around that to maintain your balance, you know, as if you're turning the corner and kind of coming back inside to go get the quarterback, right. And kind of going around the tackle. And in this case, it would have been like a right tackle because you're the, the way the you're, you're dipping to your right. So he did that and there was a little, he was off balance in that. Now I'll be curious to see where is he if he continues to work there. What does he look like um, in mini camp even, and then in training camp doing that drill? Because it's it would be a new thing for him. So it's just another way to find like what can this guy do? And there were times they'd line him up on the line last year, but mostly in a stand up position. They, not mostly, but it would be in a stand up position. They would move him around, but this time they're trying to rush, you know, put him down, see if he can do this again. See this is. I'm recording this on May 22nd. These are times where you experiment with things to see 
does this make sense for them to continue this and see what he can do? And you may as well, because you got Frankie Louvu and Bobby Wagner in there, a linebacker, and you, you want to find a way to see what can Jameis do to help you more because these guys are going to get the reps and there's two linebacker sets. It's going to be those two. So how can Davis help you in other ways? And that would certainly be a way that you can get another guy on the field. Who's a good athlete. He does have good length. He's got 33 inch arms. And just by way of comparison, I looked at like chop Robinson, for example, edge rusher, 32 and a half inch arms, Javante Jean Baptiste, who was a seventh round pick. 33 and three quarter inch arms. So obviously a little bit longer. Um, Jared Verge from Florida state, 33 and a half. So it's not like he has, they're not, it's not tremendous length. It's good length. And, and that's, that's what you need. So we'll be curious to see if he does there. Cause again, he is a good athlete. And I think it's very smart to find a way to get him on the field to see what else he can do. It's, it's, Listen, it's why Niles Paul years ago moved from receiver to, to tight end. I mean, it was either going to be there or you know on, over to defense, but the movement tight end because you just want to find a way to keep a guy like that. What more can you do? So, but anyway, so that's what he's doing. But when they went to seven on seven, to be clear, he was working at linebacker, and then even after those early drills, he went back with his group um, at linebacker. So um, that's that's what he was doing. But and there was one stretch where he had one stretch in the seven on seven where covering uh, John Bates, good coverage off the line, no separation next play looks like man, but then drops into a zone fine. And then the next play was against running back Jeremy McNichols. He was McNichols was fl- was out to the left or actually in the number two receiver on the left. So Davis is Davis plays with good leverage forces, you know, take basically shades him you know, gets on the inside, plays inside leverage. And then McNichols, he forces them to cut outside. That's what you want. And that is exactly what you want from that linebacker in that spot is to do that. And that was, that's something that he's improved on with, but still once in a while will get beat inside because that's where the running back wants to go. That's where the big yards are. So if you force them outside, they're going to live with that. Um, if, if there's a few yard, if it's a five yard, in this case, there was no catch, but if you, you, they will live with that just because that's where you're not going to get as big a play out there. So um, anyways, that's what he did there. Going back to Forbes was working with the first group as a corner in the seven on seven. Again, let's just see where it goes. And I did tell you last week that they're not going to just hand him the job. So wherever it goes, he's going to have to earn it, but he was working there with the first team. Um, And, you know, there are times where it's like, I, he's a guy that I want to see more of and just not measure every little thing um, or not like nitpick every little thing, but see where's the growth. Because like when you're facing the, this, this is where those joint practices are going to be very telling for him. And by the way, Quinn, we already knew about the Miami one and he, they are looking for another one. As I told you, they played the jets in the first game in the preseason game. So I don't know if it would be them or would you have another team come in earlier than that? just for some work or go somewhere. You know, they're not going to go up to Baltimore because they play them during the season. But, you know, is there another team that maybe you can do something with? Anyway, that aside, I would like to see him against some other teams just to, to measure that growth because I told you yesterday, like the Baltimore, maybe I maybe I didn't, but maybe I told the, the club members this, but the Baltimore um, joint practice was very eye-opening for him and not necessarily in the good way. So we're not definitely not in the good way because you saw him get beat more more than more than you'd like. Um, anyways, so there was one route he had today where it's good initial coverage against Dami Brown, cuts back outside on the scramble drill, and, and Forbes kind of stumbles a little bit, and then Brown makes the catch. Um, nice play by Brown, good job by him. Um, wasn't bad coverage off the snap, it's just scramble drill. And that's this that's part of the NFL too, and it's part of what you got to do. Uh, and especially when you're going to go against these quarterbacks here with Mariota and Daniels and Mariota, because obviously they can both do that very well. All right. So um, Terry McLaurin, I brought him up earlier. And again, competition, right? This is what they like. And he had a nice catch from a nice, he made a nice catch off a pass from Mariota down the left side. So I was watching another part of the field on this. And then you look at just watching a guy come off the line. 
And so you don't always see every little thing, but you know, when I look up, it's on the left sideline and, and McLaurin's going down and just kind of reaches out and makes a nice, you know, lunging sort of grab. And I was, was pretty pumped up when he came off the field. He, his basically what he said is, uh, because it was on St. Juice side, he said he was hype. He was sitting on the out. I said, we got something for that. So, you know, I don't, I didn't see if there was a fake, I didn't see it. So I apologize. What I do know is he was open. And so clearly he would have gotten St. Juice to, he would have had him bite on something short and then just gets around him. So anyway, now on the pass to Dotson that I brought up earlier on, on the pass from, from Jaden Daniels, McLaurin, again, very pumped up and said, and he went over to Dot. I mean, he went over to Jahan, very pumped up and said, you're so much better with your hands. And he was talking about at the line of scrimmage and getting away from guys. He was like really pumped up about this aspect for Jahan. So file that away that if if he indeed is better with his hands at the line, kid could have a nice year for himself and, and then really help. Like I've told you before, like I have not, I would not give up on that kid yet because there's just too much there. He's smooth. He's got ability after the catch. We saw that, you know, at, you saw, we've seen enough flashes of that, especially his first year. And I, I would not give up on that kid at all. But if he's if he's is better with his hands at the line, and if Terry's going to make continue to be that pumped up, then I think that would uh, bode well for him as as um, as the season go as the season gets underway in a few months. Um. So, and the other the other thing you see out there sometimes too, and I like watching guys like Bobby Wagner. I mean, the guys like this is just. Mid late May for him, right? He's done this forever and he's really good. But sometimes you see that veteran savvy. And I pointed out leadership stuff that he does. And I talked about that last week, but even like little things on watching him, basically he's over Austin Eckler and Eckler is just, you know, lined up inside on the right, you know, third receiver inside on the right. And he's all lined up over him, but he's going to drop into his zone, but you don't want to give that away. So it's like you can start to see as the as the quarterback gets ready to get it, he's kind of leaning inside so he can get to his spot a little bit quicker. Just one of those veteran savvy things. Now, if a quarterback sees that, well, then you might know he's going to drop inside there. But I think the way he timed it, I don't think the quarterback's going to see that. But he certainly was leaning in that way and got to where it needed to go and and took away. In fact, there was because there was going to be a slant to the other side. And it's I wish I had asked him this after because I did talk to him afterwards. But we're not going to go over every play in practice. Um, but, you know, I think he he clearly noticed something because when he the the pass was a slant to the other side. So he got in position to what he would have made help made a play on the ball or a tackle for a shorter gain. In other words, now, he wouldn't have made a play on the ball. He would have made a tackle for a short gain or would have helped in that area. So veteran savvy. The other thing, Jeremy Chin is a big dude. And I think that's one thing that jumps out too. And it gives you that ability to put him down in the box. Again, as I, we've talked about before, like Dan Quinn likes to use a lot of three receiver sets, excuse me, three safety sets. And and Joe Witt, I would imagine is going to continue that. And Joe Witt, by the way, has a lot of energy on the field. And and I, I think that's going to be a good thing on that side of the ball, especially because he'll be working with a lot with the secondary, the coaching there folks is going to be so much better. And I'm curious to see who gets impacted the most and how, and what is the result in their play? Because it's just, I cannot, we I cannot understate how much better I think this defensive staff is um, this year. And then one other thing that I, well, there's a couple other things, but one thing from Dan Quinn, there was one point during the seven on seven, he goes up to um, uh, who, I can't remember who, who it was. It was Bryson Tremaine. That's who it was. That's right. That's right. So he goes up to Bryson Tremaine and, you know, hat got his hat on backwards. Tremaine's on the offensive sideline and he says, you're walking up to the line. What the F? He didn't say F. He finished the sentence. Get up there like you're ready to attack the mother effer. And he didn't say effer. But it was a, I mean, he wasn't happy. Wasn't loud. Wasn't, you know, wasn't overly forceful, but the point was made. And those are the kind of little things that you want to see, right? And listen, we talked a lot about, we would talk about this stuff with, about Eric Bieniemy last year and just like some of the intensity he would bring. So you let's see how this plays out. But that's, I think, 
you know, I think it's good for these receivers. You got to have some, some, some sense of urgency, especially if you're Bryson Tremaine and you're trying to earn a, earn a roster spot, you're not going to get cut on May 22nd, but you not better not repeat those kind of mistakes, not even mistake, but you better show the urgency to get up to the line and play back. Cause one of the things it's funny, cause one of the things Brian Robinson talked about today is that he just feels they're going to play a lot faster. And he felt like they were going to be more, use a lot more no huddle than they have in the past. So don't know. We'll see if that plays out that way. They typically aren't going to say a whole lot at this point. And it's funny because people talk about the offense. I remember when Griffin was here in his first rookie in the first training camp, and you're out there watching practice every day. I'm going to tell you the offense, they ran the opener what looked at the plays. They ran looked a lot different than from what we saw during training camp, right? I mean, you put in a lot of your offense. It's not like they're putting in new, you know, they're not, it's not like they're putting in a new offense, but they were showing, they weren't running, showing everything that they were going to do for sure. So how much of that really happens with the, with no huddle? I don't know, but Brian Robinson says they're going to use a lot more of it this year. So stay tuned and see how that unfolds. Um, John Allen talked today. It's the first time we've talked to him since the season ended, actually before the season ended, because even on the last day of, uh, the clean out day, he did not talk to the media for whatever reason. Um, but, and I've talked to you about this before and you know, that we know he was upset during the season. He should have been, it was a terrible season and guys like him who have been here for a while and keep trying to wait for this turnaround that you, they knew was not happening. So clearly you would understand the frustration. He does not want to go anywhere. And he even said he goes, he's happy. He feels like this, this whole experience has been reinvigorating. Says he loves the coaching staff. Seems happy. He's not, again, he's, he doesn't seem like he wants to go anywhere. So anyway, not that, I don't know that anybody was still wondering about that, but you shouldn't. His, his, he wants to be here um, and see where it goes. Um, as far as Mariota, again, I go back to how the, I think there's a lot of energy with the staff. And Mariota said, he talked to us as well, said that his passion is still there. At times in the past, there have been times in the past, it wasn't there, but he does, he likes the staff and feels like that's kind of given him a boost. He also likes Brian Johnson a lot. So, you know, I think that's that's been good for him. And he it seems like he's in a good mental spot to be, helpful to a guy like Daniels. So I think that, that, that will be good as well, because he's going to have to be, this is not a, this is the comp, the competition is between Jaden and Daniels. So this as soon as Jay, I, we all know that as soon as Jaden, as soon as Jaden shows he's ready, then he's going to be starting. That's they've told him that he knows that. And, and there you go. Um, so um, finally, again, we talked to Bobby Wagner. I'm going to play my interview with him probably sometime next week or sometime in June, whatever. But one of the things is funny because he was asked about one of the transitions coming to the East Coast. And I think any sports fan can understand this. He said, where the biggest thing he's getting used to is, is having to watch basketball games of teams that he likes at 1030 at night on the East Coast. So he must be a Lakers fan because he said, unfortunately, they're not playing anymore. So in, in these playoff games a little bit earlier, but that is something that he brought up. I think anybody who is a sports fan can understand that. And if you're on the East Coast and the game's at 1030, man, is it hard to, to stay up for those things. So anyway, that's it for me. That's a wrap up of the second week of OTAs that we're able to watch. They still have another practice on Thursday. We will not be out there. In fact, we will not be out there next week. We will be back. They're, there's nothing scheduled, so they'll have it the following week. And then the week after that, they have their mini camp. So that's when we'll be back out there to watch practice. I will have multiple podcasts next week just to keep this going because there's still a lot to talk about, still interviews I got to play. And so there you go. Anyway, appreciate you tuning in. As always, thanks for listening. Talk to you next time. <laughs>